Okay, welcome to part four. Uh, this is yet another model, and there are so many models on leadership. Uh, this is just another one that your book um, talks about, uh, the multidimensional model of sport leadership. And leadership effectiveness in sport um, can vary depending on the characteristics of the athlete, leader behaviors, characteristics, and constraints of the situation. Just kind of everything that we have been talking about. And so the model looks like this. Uh, that you have um, the athlete satisfaction and performance, uh, which is the consequences, box seven. This depends on the leader's behavior. How do they behave? That's four, five, and six. And then it depends on the characteristics. And so, situation box number one on the antecedents, that situational characteristics, socio-cultural norms of the group, organizational climate, competitiveness of the group, either process or outcome-oriented, all of those are those situational characteristics. Box number two is leader characteristics, the age, experience, coaching style, personality. And then box three is the member box. What are their ages, gender, ability? All of these lead to the kinds of behaviors, that leader behavior. You know, what is required? What is the actual behavior? So what's going on? And then what's the preferred behavior? And then all of these end up being the performance and satisfaction. So in that required leader behavior, the organizational system itself dictates behaviors, and people are expected to conform to the established norms. Coaches are expected to behave in specific ways with reporters, other coaches, spectators. They are expected to behave in a certain way. Do they always? No. So then you have the actual leader behavior. The behavior that the leader exhibits, the leader's characteristics such as personality, ability, and experience affect these behaviors directly. And then the preferred preferences for specific leader behaviors. How do you expect them to act? That personality variable. Those antecedents, that age and maturity and gender, nationality and type of sport. There have been numerous studies focusing on conditions or antecedents that affect leader behavior. The consequences of leader behaviors. So studies basically looked at what players' situations did to cause those behaviors and what happened after the coaches responded with specific behaviors. Was it good? Was it bad? With age and maturity, what they have discovered is older, more athletically mature athletes prefer coaches who are more autocratic and socially supportive. Preferences for training decreases from early to senior year of high school, but then increases again at the university level. 
this first bullet, that more autocratic, is definitely more true of college athletes. College athletes are usually more serious about their sport and see sport as an autocratic enterprise. With gender, males prefer training and instructive behaviors and an autocratic coaching style, where females in the studies preferred more democratic and participatory coaching that allows them to help make decisions. This would suggest that coaches of men's sports should meet, be more directive and provide plenty of instructional feedback, and coaches of women's sports should allow their athletes opportunity for input. But there's still more similarities between men and women, males and females, than there are differences. Both genders want high-frequency feedback of training and instruction. With nationality, cultural background may influence leadership um, preferences. In the United States, Britain, and Canada, there is no notable differences in preferred coaching styles. But in universities in Japan, Athletes preferred a more social support and autocratic leadership style. With the type of sports, participants in highly interactive sports, such as volleyball players, prefer an autocratic, sport, autocratic style more than participants in coaching sports, like bowling, do. One study suggested that even the task someone has or the position that they play can influence the type of coaching style that they want. And the last characteristic is the psychological characteristics. Athletes with internal locus of control show a strong preference for training and instruction, while athletes with external locus of control preferred more autocratic. So if you feel you control what's going on, you prefer training and instruction. If you feel the circumstances control what's going on, you prefer the coach to tell you what to do. Females who have high anxiety levels on a regular basis prefer a coach who is positive and provides the social support they desire. A female with low levels of anxiety on a regular basis are not as worried about the coach being positive and socially supportive. With the consequences of leadership, satisfaction, cohesion, and performance. And we're going to go into more detail with this. But optimal performance and satisfaction result when a coach leads in a style that matches the group's preferences. So even if you are designed exactly opposite of the team's desire of what they want you to be, you will still be more successful if you choose a style that fits them or find a team that better suits you. With satisfaction, the coach and athlete um, compatibility in decision-making style, generous social support of the coach, rewarding democratic decisions. Team sport athletes find positive coaching behaviors even more important than individual sport athletes do. Cohesion. 
Coaches high in training and instruction, democratic behavior, social support, tend to have teams with greater cohesion. Exercisers exhibiting more task-related behaviors, providing task-specific reinforcements, were associated with more cohesion in their groups. And then performance. Most research supports the notion that specific coaching behaviors are related to increases in performance, especially when the actual and preferred coaching styles are congruent. So losing teams may need more social support from their leaders to sustain motivation. And so leaders who helped by facilitating attributes like self-efficacy and competitiveness. So if a coach instills the pursuit of excellence among team members, they will feel like they can actually compete competitively and accomplish what they set out to do. At the same time, leaders create a situation or environment that supports a compelling vision, key goals, productive environment, and productive motivational climates. So in fulfilling what is mentioned in the first bullet, the leader of the groups is setting up the climate that invites success. And so for part four, we are going to stop here. Part five will pick up with transformational leadership in sport.